It's your job to <laughs> control me. Hi, I'm Lou and this is Lily Rowe. And that was the first thing that a 15 year old said to me on the first session of Forest School on one of our programs. So I thought that would be an interesting place to start when I'm picking how to work with behaviour at Forest School. So um, that particular learner, he had been labelled with ADHD and possibly some other things. And um, that is genuinely what he thought. He thought that it was the adult's job to control him. He felt that he had no power to control himself or be responsible for his actions, his behaviours. And I thought that's really interesting how we have got into a situation where the use of sanctions and rewards within our education system has given that message to that young person that they feel disempowered to take responsibility for their own actions and that they give that power to somebody else completely. So how do we work with behaviour at Forest School in a way that supports the individuals to feel empowered and to take responsibility for their own actions, thoughts and behaviour in the future and therefore ultimately create positive change for them in their lives in general? So in this video, I'm going to share with you seven mm -hmm. tips that I've used at Forest School when working okay. with behaviour. Okay. So let's get into it. Before we start, a big thank you to Sibylla who inspired this video by sending me an email and asking me a question and we thought that would make a great video topic. So tip one is that we don't work with behaviour. <laughs> or at least we don't just work with behaviour. So all behaviour is driven by emotions and emotional states and all emotions are driven by needs, either met needs or usually when we're talking about the behaviour being exhibited that is a bit more challenging, it's usually unmet needs. So from a forest school perspective, we don't just work with the surface level behaviour, which if you imagine the behaviour being like the ripples on top of the surface of the ocean, we want to get deeper and acknowledge emotional states and value all emotional states and then we want to get even deeper than that and try and explore what are those needs and particularly the unmet needs um, and help the individuals also recognize those emotions and needs that drive the behavior because it's only through working at that depth do you help individuals um, you know, make changes to their behaviour, what they choose to act in the world. Tip two is um, borrowed from Dr. William Glasser, who was a psychiatrist uh, who came up with choice theory. And that is all behaviour is communication. So as forest school leaders, we want to recognise that all behaviour, regardless of how challenging or how violent it, it might be, it's communicating something. So going back to tip one and actually looking at those needs, that behaviour is communicating what those needs are of that individual. And I find that if you reframe behaviour as communication, it can be quite useful in terms of then how we look at that and how we observe it um, and then also how we interact with that and, and support it. Tip three is know your neuroscience. So some forest school training courses might cover a little bit of neuroscience, a little bit of how our brain grows and develops. Others might not. And if that's the case and you haven't had that in your training, then I recommend reading around the subject. Um, so understanding how our brain is very malleable and will adapt and grow and develop based on the environmental circumstances that we're born into, uh, as in we are truly a product of our environment and what's happened in our early life and particularly sort of the first couple of years of life where the brain is uh, you know doing so much connecting and growing also understanding how stress might affect the brain and how um, that might 
cause emotional hijacking where the sort of the lower more reactive parts of the brain the sort of more primitive parts of the brain might take over without our rational thinking parts of the brain uh, really being involved uh, which I guess is like a defense mechanism um, but it is it is possible that that might happen in a in the split moment when somebody's under stress and therefore understanding that that's possible and that people might not choose their behavior because they're literally just reacting from a, like a survival instinct uh, that can be quite powerful in thinking then how do we work with that if somebody hasn't chosen to do that you know it's not premeditated it is purely a reaction <laughs> Uh, also understanding how like certain hormones like the stress hormone cortisol affects the brain um, and how that affects learning and development as well can be really quite important again particularly if you're working with more vulnerable learners or those that might have expo experienced trauma or very difficult kind of early childhoods um, because yeah that will have affected how their brain has grown and developed so yeah know your neuroscience that can be quite handy for forest school tip four is ask the village so forest school aims to be more balanced in terms of where the power is so we wouldn't have the adults uh, you know like dictating the rules to the children it would be much more collaborative so uh, you know if you see the forest school group the community as a as a village as it were um, often at the beginning of a forest school program you might invite the individuals the group to form an agreement so coming up with like your group ethos or the way that you want to work together whilst you're at forest school so kind of getting the children the learners and what well, and the adults as well everybody who's involved with the community to decide you know how do we want to be when we're in this space and what that means is if you've got that done as a collaborative agreement if there are any problems if there are any issues if people have started to do things that are outside of that agreement then you can go back to the village back to the forest school community and sort of ask them well okay what what do we do about this um, and so you can kind of put that back onto the learners uh, which also encourages social skills and personal skills in terms of uh, resolving conflict or um, negotiating agreements and all of those important things that we need to do as human beings um, one little side note I would say on this is try not to put a spotlight on individuals if there's one particular child who has done something that's outside of the agreement try not to say well you know so and so has done this because obviously that puts that person uh, you know as a uh, it can put pressure on them and increase stress which which might not be actually useful in terms of working with their behavior and needs as we've sort of mentioned in terms of the neuroscience um, so uh, try to do it anonymously uh, you know you doesn't you don't have to single out an individual when you're kind of talking with the group um, and then you know see what the group comes up with in terms of solutions or things to try um, and it's amazing what even very young children can kind of come out with I think that um, the, the need for fairness uh, is something that's within us even from quite a young age so even early years children I've found have been able to articulate solutions uh, you know in an age appropriate way uh, and maybe facilitated by the adults who are caring for them Tip five is to work non-judgmentally. So what does that look like? So often within the education system, schools and other organizations are based on sanctions and rewards type approaches to working with behavior. Uh, as in, you know, somebody does something outside of the rules, they get punished. Somebody who does something very in line with the rules or what you're hoping for, they get rewarded, whether that's stickers or house points uh, or praise even is a reward. 
So Forest School will try to operate outside of that sanctions and rewards based system and use non judgmental techniques and strategies instead. Um, I realise that this can be quite a mindset shift for some people, particularly if you've worked in education for a long time, because it's kind of drummed into you to use sanctions and rewards. Um, but there are reasons why this is. Um, so firstly, for self-esteem reasons, sometimes using rewards like praise can actually trigger challenging or difficult behaviours within a person, particularly more vulnerable learners, because their self-image is not in line with that praise. And so it causes a lot of kind of confusion um, and therefore they might not be able to handle it and it causes certain stresses and behaviours then manifest. Also, it's worth mentioning that uh, rewards and praise will also detract from the play experience. As we know that play has to be intrinsically motivated, so any external reward such as house points or praise or whatever that reward form that rewards takes it's going to detract from that intrinsically motivated experience and the sense of satisfaction that a person gets just from initiating that 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 behavior whatever they're doing um, so yeah there's a couple of reasons why we don't use rewards and sanctions. I've also done another video about why we don't praise at Forest School, which I'll pop the link in the description below to explore that in more depth. But what I want to talk about here is actually the alternative strategies that we can use, so non judgmental strategies. Um, so it sometimes is just a shift in how we use language. So instead of kind of coming up and making a judgment over what somebody's done, we just say that we notice it. You know, I noticed that you found some string and you measured it. And I noticed you used a clove hitch to tie it to that stick. Uh, and then I noticed you kind of square lashing it together. So sometimes it's just like, say what you see, say what you see, instead of kind of going, go, wow, well done, you tied a clove hitch. You know, it's just a subtle difference um, and uh, because people don't feel judged that can make them feel safer within the forest school environment uh, and it also opens up doors for the learner to talk about well, why they tied a clove hitch or a square lashing whereas praise sometimes can be a sort of a closed door a, a full stop you know you made that judgment and then you move on as opposed to an invite for conversation um, in more heated moments at Forest School, I found non-violent communication a very useful technique. It doesn't have to just be used in more heated moments. It is a, a, a very effective practice just generally. Um, and it was created by a, a guy called Marshall Rosenberg, who unfortunately has passed on now, but there is lots of YouTube footage of him running different trainings. Um, and he believes that any form of judgment within language is violent, hence why it's called non-violent communication. Um, because often judgmental language, and if you think about the practice of sanctions and rewards, it is fundamentally manipulative. You're trying to manipulate somebody at that more shallow behavior level, rather than exploring the emotions and the needs. Sorry, there's an aeroplane like practicing overhead. It's a really noisy morning this morning. <laughs> ah. So nonviolent communication or NVC, it's a massive topic and there's lots of books written about it. But in brief, in a nutshell, it's a way of talking non-judgmentally, um, which is around recognizing your own kind of emotions and needs and expressing them requests. So there are four stages to it. So the first is to make a concrete observation. So something that is not judgmental. So for example, Joe, you're waving a knife. So I'm not saying whether that's good or bad. I'm just stating the facts. Then the second is to identify how that makes you feel. So you've got to tap in and tune into yourself and your own emotional state. So I feel scared. And then the third stage is to go deeper and to look at, well, what is the need that isn't being met that's driving that emotion? 
So it could be, I've got a need for my safety and your safety and everybody's safety. And then fourth is you make a request. So please could you sheath the knife and pop it on the block. So the whole process would be, so the whole process would be, Joe, you're waving a knife. I feel scared because I've got a need for my safety, your safety and everybody else's safety. Please could you sheath the knife and pop it on the block. So it's a way of kind of being very clear with what you want to happen and also kind of explaining or exploring how what is happening in that moment and how it's affecting you. So it also provides like real life feedback to individuals as to how their actions and behaviours in the world affect other people. Um, so it can be quite hard hitting compared to uh, the, the more shallow approaches of like sanctions which often you know somebody gets punished uh, you know they have to stay in a break time or they get sent to isolation or they get detention often that punishment is not directly related to whatever the behavior or the action was that caused that sanction to, to be put upon them uh, whereas actually hearing somebody's emotions and needs can be quite powerful because it actually demonstrates how that current situation is affecting other people um, and it also of course is modeling emotional intelligence skills in terms of verbalizing and recognizing our emotions and needs um, so yeah MVC is a really powerful technique to practice I would also say in this tip about being non-judgmental is this also applies to ourselves and being non-judgmental on ourselves. We are beautifully flawed human beings and we can't get it right all of the time. Um, and so also cutting ourselves some slack and not judging ourselves too harshly when we cock things up uh, is really, really important to sort of be gentle on yourself. You know, everybody's doing the best they can uh, with what they've got and just sort of trying to remember that. Tip six is to use restorative approaches. So if there has been conflict within your forest school program between two or more people, then not in the moment of heated emotions because perhaps the rational, reasonable thinking parts of the brain are not accessible in those moments, but at some point after, that might be days or even next week after, create space to have some sort of restorative discussion again non-judgmentally and perhaps try to tap in to those feelings and needs um, between those participants so um, a bit like the restorative justice techniques that get used in prison services and stuff uh, if there has been I don't know some violence or something and there's one person's the perpetrator and the other person the victim then um, ask that victim to express their feelings and needs ask the uh, the aggressor their feelings and needs and get them to talk together about it in a in a facilitated kind of held way um, because again that could be really powerful for people to understand how their behaviors um, affect other people at that deeper needs based level so the seventh and final tip I'd like to share is to recognize the power of storytelling. So um, I've found that telling oral stories, as in not from storybooks, but creating your own stories, or there might also be traditional stories that, uh, that fit the bill. Um, if you find one or create one that has uh, within it like it's addressing whatever the issue is that you're experiencing at your forest school then you tell it just to the whole group or to a small group that includes the individual or the individuals that might be expressing uh, you know difficult behavior then that story can work at like a subconscious level so it's got the it's got amazing power like so it's not it's not 
pulling a single person out and putting a spotlight on them or judging them um, and it's also sort of working underneath our conscious mind I think there's something very powerful about stories like human beings aren't storytellers you know story speaks to us at a deeper level and so um, you know <laughs> telling stories can be a really powerful way of getting people to think about things in a different way or uh, you know identifying with the archetypes of the characters within the story uh, so I found that can be quite effective at Forest School too so that's our seven tips for working with behavior at Forest School what have you found worked at your forest school do let us know in the comment section below if you've liked this video do give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our channel so you can join us in the woods again next time and thanks for watching Bye. Bye. working with behavior can be quite an art being non-judgmental is a good place to start digging a bit deeper to uncover the needs and help learners to meet them when you head to the dream. Not do it again. <laughs> oh, bye. Oh, not do it again, Mummy. <laughs>